is called to order. Glad to see you here this evening. Thank you for showing up. Alderman Groff, would you call the roll, please? Bauman? Present. Eber? Here. Eber? Here. Serta? Here. Davis? Here. Groff is here. Kittleson? Here. Manny? Excused. Honeymoon? Meyer? Here. Montemayor? Here. Radke? Here. Pagali? Here. Stephan? Excused. Susha? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweele? Here. 14 present. Thank you, Alderman Graf. A quorum is present. Um, I need someone to make a motion to approve the minutes of August 1. So moved. Thank you. We do need to make a slight change on that. Uh, mention that the price of the city's industrial park land is $22,000 an acre, not twenty-five. dollars So that correction will be put in on the minutes of the Committee of the Whole of August 1. Any further discussion about the minutes? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Number three on our agenda, municipal court information. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've asked that some of the committee members, if they're present, I'd like to make a motion to open up the floor, those who are involved in um, this study that formulated this study. Second. All those in favor, any discussion on opening the floor to receive information about the municipal court? Yes, Alderman Graff. Um, is it for anybody from the, the committee that was there, or um, are there some more people that you're expecting? Just the committee members, okay. if any are present who would like to speak. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to open the floor to the committee members of the municipal court regarding information? For the aldermen who weren't in on the municipal court information first time around, which I think if I have this correct would be Alderman Kittleson, Alderman Eldenburg, uh, Alderman Davis, Alderman Susha, and Alderman Radke. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Yes. Motion passes. I see um, Mr. Warner is here. I bet you're going to give us some information. That would be me. You, need, <laughs> you don't need my address. We don't have a city clerk. Yes, please. Uh, 2327 East Shelley Court in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Mike Warner. Madam Chairman, Common Council, and the viewing public, uh, good evening to all of you. And it is a pleasure to be here to talk to you about this. I guess I wish to speak to you about the city's municipal court for several reasons. As I watched a recent council meeting, I was surprised to hear statements that clearly are contrary to the facts regarding municipal courts across the state of Wisconsin. The municipal court committee was formed to investigate the feasibility of forming such a court in the city of Sheboygan. The committee had seven members, three city residents, attorney David Gass, Mr. Ron Erline, and Mr. Ronald Beenan. Along with that was the city's court services officer, the city attorney, former alderman Bill Wongaman, and myself. Early on, the committee was very, very skeptical, skeptical about the creation of a municipal court. So it set up a five-step process that put the burden of their decision on facts and not on opinion. And to take politics out of play to make sure that a sound decision was made. The five steps or checks and balances were as follows. Delivery of justice, financial, physical costs for the court, administration of the court, and the impact on the current circuit court system. We felt that all those issues were very important if we were going to make a recommendation to the Common Council to move forward with the municipal court. For number one, the delivery of justice, one of the questions was would it improve remain the same or be better. The conclusion was that justice would be improved as municipal cases would be heard and addressed in a more timely manner than in a circuit court. Financial, would the system support itself, provide income to the city? Conclusion, financially the system will sustain itself and provide income to the city each year. Physical costs. What would it cost to set up the court and to operate the court? The conclusion of the committee was 
the physical cost to establish the court will be paid for in the first year of operation. That's the first full 12 month period of operation. Take any 12 months starting from the beginning of any month. And that's how this pro forma budget was set up. Administration, makeup of the system, the judge, the staff. The conclusion of the court committee was that the court should have a part-time judge, I believe it was $18,000 a year, uh, and a full-time court clerk, and also a part-time clerk position. The judge and clerk would be hired at the onset with a part-time position being filled only if needed. Part of our belief was that if we went to a software system that used the county's current system to obtain a lot of information, we wouldn't need that part-time clerk. And that was recommended. The next one was impact on the current circuit court system. Positives and negatives for the county court system and positives and negatives for the city of Sheboygan. What would those be? The circuit court would benefit from the establishment of a municipal court in the city of Sheboygan by removing 7,000 cases from their caseload, which would help them provide better service and become more efficient. Of that 7,000, only about 1,500 actually come to trial in a municipal court, but you still have to deal with them all in one form or another. The benefits to the city outweigh any negatives, providing quicker response to city ordinance violations, court code violations, and resolution of municipal issues in a more timely fashion. Fines would decrease and the city would keep a larger portion of those fines. That's a fact. The system would be self-supporting and would benefit the city budget. In each of these steps, the committee's conclusion was that the establishment of a municipal court in the city of Sheboygan would be in the best interest of the city, its taxpayers, landowners, and all city residents. A conclusion that was not based on politics, emotion, or turf, but sound facts. The year-long study surveyed and interviewed dozens of existing municipal courts across the state. We talked to Plymouth, Sheboygan Falls, and Kohler, which all have established municipal courts, and asked them to join in with us either as a joint system or to share some of the common things, such as court software, which I mentioned earlier, that would tie in with the present countywide crime reporting system a real shared service in function and cost for all of those involved. After watching the Common Council meeting where an attempt to rescind the municipal court was made, it occurred to me that many may be making their decision based solely on emotion or lack of knowledge. I would ask that each of you obtain a copy of the committee's report and talk to some of those involved in that committee to find out what the facts are. Communities across Wisconsin are creating municipal courts and for good reason. Not because the circuit courts are at fault, but because the system is clogged and inefficient in dealing with local ordinance violations and issues. Over half of all communities in Wisconsin have municipal courts. Your question to yourself should be why? Why do over half the communities in the state of Wisconsin now have municipal courts, why? The answer is because municipal courts work. A municipal court will help improve the residential areas that need more attention, especially those areas where the poorest of the poor live. It will levy fines that are less, lowering them from $180 to $102, saving residents money. Every area that a municipal court touches will be better served and the county court system can concentrate on the higher level crimes which it is designed to deal with. I don't have too many more pages but this is something we worked on for a long time. You recently accepted a, sell a settlement in the Matlin case that was a fraction of what was owed. Although I am not going to claim that a municipal court would have solved that problem completely, it may have helped to some extent. You know, I ask each of you to consider what is best for the city of Sheboygan, her people, homeowners, renters, and all taxpayers. Perhaps you need to have your law committee review the documents in depth that came from the Special Municipal Court Committee and bring back their findings. I am convinced that if someone looks at the facts, they will come to the same conclusion that the Special Municipal Court Committee did. And the council can then make an informed decision to move the municipal court forward, as did the previous council. Think city of Sheboygan's best interests. Think facts. 
And if you do that, you cannot come to another conclusion but to move the municipal court forward, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner, is there a date on that? So in case some of these new aldermen ask for a copy of that, on that information that you just City gave to us? City clerk would have it, but I think we brought that in last summer. I'm, summer uh, of 2004? It. It's this, this report dated September 27th? Probably. Yep. It was due by October. It was due by October. Mm -hmm. So that Thank you. Right. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now I have some questions that I would like to address to Chuck Adams. I've asked him to be here tonight so he could share that information with all of us. Are Do I need a motion? Speakers? Yes, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. Mr. Beenan, yes, please. You were on the committee. Yes, I was. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, speak to all of you. I'm going to speak up. Uh, I think Mike did a fine job of... of uh, Mr. Beenan. Yes. Oh, I'm Adams. sorry. Ron Beenan, 525 South 28th Street Thank you. in Sheboygan. Um, I think Mike did a fine job of, of uh, defining what the committee uh, found to be the facts of the municipal court. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to speak on, on behalf of the, the citizen members of that committee, and that is that, in fact, there were a few of us who came in skeptical there weren't too many people who came into this committee, who started this committee, who really believed <clears throat> or really knew much about what a municipal court was. And our findings were, when, I mean, when we left this committee in October, September, October, I think the people that were on this committee felt that we had done a good job. We felt we had been thorough. We felt confident that this would work for the city. We felt confident that, that the city would pursue this municipal court. Um, the, more, the most persuasive arguments were from other communities who had established municipal courts and had proven to be not only, not only are they working, not only are they good for the citizens, not only is it good for the community, but they have proven to be profitable and increased the, the revenue to the city. Um, very few communities, uh, communities had any objection to uh, running the municipal courts. Very few, no communities regretted starting the municipal court. And I think the only one complaint was that perhaps the selection of the judge, maybe their process for selecting a judge or for, was, was not proper or they didn't do a good job of that and, and they had a little problem there. But I think of all the communities that we, that we surveyed, the responses were, were unbelievable. Um, I never expected to have to read that much, but almost every community that we sent, a, that we requested information from that had a municipal court reported back to us and we were convinced by their testimony and by what we found out and by what we looked into for cost that this would be profitable and, and advantageous for the, for the citizens of this community. And speaking on behalf, if I may, of the, of the rest of the members, we felt confident that we did a very good job. We did everything that was needed to be done. We got it done in a timely manner and we came out with a positive attitude about the community uh, municipal court and, and we think that it ought to be brought forward and, and moved on. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Bean, and I think your committee worked very hard. Mr. Chuck Adams, would you like to address us and give us some information? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have three questions for you, Chuck. The first one being, do you feel a city municipal court would be more expedient in terms of time scheduling when cases are actually heard and more receptive to city issues, given that only city ordinances and traffic cases would be heard, not necessarily competing against the circuit court criminal cases? I think the answer to that is, is probably yes. Um, as far as um, scheduling goes, um, I think it's pretty clear that they try hard over in the circuit court to, to get our cases done uh, quickly, uh, but it just doesn't always happen. Um, as an example of that, next week I've got a jury trial going on a drunk driving case that occurred in 2002, um, so more than three years ago. And that's beyond the norm, but oftentimes, especially with uh, jury trials, it can take a long, long time uh, to get those cases heard. And the reason for that primarily is that um, city cases are not a priority in the circuit court system. And it's not because they don't want to treat it as a priority, it's just simply because they have to treat other things, criminal cases, as a higher priority. People have a right to speedy trial in criminal cases, and so the city cases um, uh, do uh, take a lower priority. Um, 
As far as uh, it, it goes with uh, whether there'll be more attention paid, again, I don't think there's any intention on the part of the circuit court or, or the judges or, or the folks in the circuit court system to pay less attention um, to, to city cases. But I think what you're going to have in, is instead of city cases, speeding tickets and, and building code cases and fire code cases, uh, just being a, a small part of a huge uh, caseload that includes much more important things, uh, you'll have a smaller court uh, that is dealing only with those kinds of things and will probably have a little more expertise in, in those kinds of things and have a little better uh, connection with uh, what's going on. Um, I've always thought all along that really the primary issue as to whether a municipal court would be a good thing or not uh, is not so much the finances. I think, I think the study committee um, makes that pretty clear. The finances will be good. Um, but it's whether we have a good judge who you know, will do a good job as a judge, as it is with a circuit court. It's the same thing with a municipal court. And so uh, I've always thought that the thing we ought to be focusing on is making sure we do a good job of uh, selecting a judge and coming up with a way of selecting the judge. Thank you, Chuck Adams. I just one question. You said you're you're waiting to do a driving problem from 2002, right. and it's a jury thing. I have a jury trial scheduled um, in for a case that occurred in 2002. Which wouldn't be municipal court anyway. Well, it would start in municipal court. I see. Um, it wouldn't be heard as a jury trial in municipal court. But what would happen then is that uh, that case, if the person wanted a jury trial right away, they could file to have it sent to municipal court, or they could hear it in municipal court first. Thank you. I understand. All right. Um, go ahead, Alderman Serda. You, you had two more questions. Right. Well, I want to, um, in the, regarding this question. Yes, Alderman Graf. Um, if I may, um, <clears throat> right now when you when you go to court, is it before the family court commissioner or the intake judge? Well, I, I don't appear in front of the, uh, um, the court commissioner. Um, the way the process works is with, with city cases, the initial court date is in front of the court commissioner on all but some of the juvenile cases. Um, and she handles just sort of the intake court. Um, I don't appear because there's no necessity to have an attorney there. Um, someone from the police department appears and just simply takes notes of was there a guilty plea or a not guilty plea. If there's and then a not, if it's a guilty plea or not guilty, then it moves on. Then it moves on and we hold pretrial conferences and, and, and court And trials. is that with the intake judge or with the circuit court judge? I know they're the same, but at, they all take turns at... Um, right. The way it works is there's an intake schedule. Um, each of the five judges takes a period of time. Every six weeks that changes. And each case is then heard in front of uh, the judge who's on intake during the time that that um, case enters the system. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Meyer. Um, thank you. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, how much is the startup cost to this court, and where is the money going to come from? I, I, I haven't been dealing with that. You'll have to look know. at the, the documents from the committee. I actually, I, didn't, I was not a member of that committee. I, I attended the meetings to provide information to the meetings. And, and could I just ask you what you mean by um, having a good judge in the municipal court? What, is, what are the qualifications for a good judge? Well, I think for one thing, we have a choice uh, as to whether we want to have a licensed attorney. I think we should. Um, I think that uh, what that does is it ensures that you have someone who's familiar with the process, um, familiar with how the system works. Another thing I think is you just need someone who's knowledgeable, uh, who understands the law, and you need someone who has the uh, proper temperament to be a judge. Um, you, you have to be able to hear cases and, and rule on them in a judicious kind of way and, and uh, not kind of fly off the handle but, uh, and not be you know, too harsh but also not be the opposite either. You kind of have to have the proper judicial temperament. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Meyer. Alderman Graf has quest an answer for you, I believe. The original budget that was um, prepared was a three-year um, budget for the municipal court. And at the time that this was prepared, very conservatively also, they figured they were going to do uh, in the first year about 7,100 cases and that would result in a, in a loss of about $3,600. In the second year, they're looking at doing 7,200 cases 
and that would result in an income of about $15,000. And the third year, they're looking at uh, doing about the same number of cases, uh, but with the additional expense that they, they will be having because it would be, um, uh, I don't know if it was the, um, the clerk that they'd have was um, additional expenses they'd have anyhow. They were looking at uh, about $8,200 for an income. And those, now this is available in the city clerk's office for anybody that doesn't have this um, City of Sheboygan Special Municipal Court Investigation Committee report. So. And, and I can tell you that the number of cases is um, very conservative. I think we're gonna go over that this year by probably 1,000 cases. Th thank you. Uh, Alderman Davis, did you have your light on? Yes. Alderman Davis. Uh, would the municipal court increase or decrease the amount of attorney time out of the city attorney's office? I think as far as attorney time, it may decrease it some just by being a little more efficient. I don't think that you're going to save a huge amount in attorney time because I'm either going to be there or I'm not. Um, I, I don't predict a huge amount of cost savings there, but I also don't think it would be more expensive. Thank you, Alderman Davis. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you, Alderman Davis. Alderman Sarda, we're back to you. Second question, which goes right along with Alderman Davis' question, and you <coughs> sort of answered it. How would a municipal court affect the efficiency of your employment responsibilities? I would think communication, um, addressing the specific issues specific to Sheboygan. Yeah, I, I think it would be um, somewhat more efficient in that you have everything all, all in one place. I think the, the one thing that I thought the committee did uh, in that regard that was probably a very good thing um, was they listened to the folks in Plymouth who had some concern that their um, court staff uh, was um, doing a lot of extra work that they didn't expect uh, and they suggested that one way to deal with that would be um, to bring together what's already there in, in the current um, uh, police computer system and, and merge that together with the municipal court system so that you didn't have a court clerk who was spending all of his or her time uh, simply taking information off of one computer screen, typing it onto another computer screen. Uh, and it's my understanding that that program has mostly been, mostly been done so that you'll be able to just simply transfer information like dates of birth, addresses, uh, names, and things like that from one system to the other. Um, uh, it was my understanding that they thought that would save about half the, the time that the current clerk in Plymouth is taking on, on that work. Do you foresee, and I'll add to that, do you foresee the communication heightened because it would be a judge solely for Sheboygan and there'd be maybe more opportunities to speak with the judge? Yeah, I mean, a, 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 a good judge obviously is going to make decisions based on the case um, and, you know, shouldn't be, um, you know, ruling in favor of one side or the other just because they happen to be employed by the city versus the state, and I wouldn't think they would do that. I think where um, there is some benefit if you have a good judge is that because you're dealing with certain kind of cases all of the time, you're going to become a little more familiar with them. I think where that really comes up is in building code um, type cases. I think that's where you, you would see um, a situation where uh, the judge is going to be familiar with those because he'll see them a lot more often um, than the, the circuit court judges do. And the circuit court judges do a good job, it's just that they've also got, they have to be generalists and that, that, can, that can be a difficult job for them. Um, and by having a municipal court judge that, that's dealing with a specific area, you, you allow that person to become an expert in those particular areas. Alderman Sardo, is that three just questions? One more. one more to go. And you just mentioned, and I'm asking this question to you, you mentioned building cold violations. I think um, it was said at one time that there wasn't a day that you didn't spend on the Matlin case. <laughs> sure seemed like it. <laughs> and this is why I'm asking this question to you. It has been said that by having a municipal court, we as a city would have the potential of addressing, addressing the quality of life issues much more effectively, housing and building cold violations to be specific. Would you agree? I would, and, and again, I don't want to, um, you know, disparage what the circuit court system does. Um, some of the judges do a really good job of trying to take time out uh, to deal with some of those issues. 
uh, and some of them I think do a very good job of that. Um, but again, having sort of the everyday dealings with that I think just makes you more efficient because you're dealing with that, uh, dealing with that on a regular basis. Um, the cases probably would be heard a little more quickly, uh, which in building code cases is really, uh, I think, uh, a good thing. Uh, now we've cut some of that time down now by some other things that we suggested, like allowing building inspectors to issue citations rather than waiting for a long time before they send them over to us for a long form complaint. Um, but uh, I think you would save some time. Uh, the other thing that I think that you can do is, um, and it seems kind of weird for a prosecutor to be saying this, but I think it's good that the fines are actually lower. Um, and it's not that the fines are lower, the forfeitures are lower, but the, the overall cost is lower because the court costs are lower. And I think that gives, especially in building code cases, um, a, a little better chance to, to deal with the situation a little more quickly. Um, I, I think that you can understand that it may be difficult for a building inspector to write out a $243 forfeiture to a little old lady who you know need, hasn't painted her siding you know in five years when she probably should have done that. Um, and there are things that they do to, to try to avoid having to do that. But sometimes at some point you do have to write a citation and it becomes a little more palatable uh, when you can write a citation that's $80 rather than $240. Uh, and, um, and then still you know the city actually ends up getting you know, just as much out of that case as, as they would um, if it were in the circuit court system with that much higher fine. Thank you, Attorney Adams. Um, Alderman Radke. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chairman. Uh, Attorney Adams, so let me ask you this. If the fines had been lower, would we have been dealing with Dina Matlin for 25 years like we had been? I mean, here's my thought on the Dina Matlin matter. I, it's, it's hard to know exactly because Mrs. Matlin's situation is just so different than any other situation. I don't think we'll ever have a situation like that again. Um, what I do think, though, is that where the benefit would have been in that situation is we would have run our own collection system. The circuit court has improved the way they collect. Um, I think the current um, clerk of courts does a very good job of that, um, given you know, some of the restraints that they have. Uh, but uh, because a municipal court would do its own collection just on city cases, um, there are a lot of things that, that we probably could have done because we would have been closer to the situation that probably would not have allowed things to get so out of hand. Um, you know, by the time I got here nine years ago, things were already far out of hand to the point where there was not a whole lot more than, we, what, than what we could do than what we already did. And, and perhaps if we would have had some of those collection procedures in place, um, it wouldn't have gotten as bad. It wouldn't have solved the problem, but I think it probably would have made it better. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. How often are uh, maybe tickets lessened or cases thrown out because of times, like winter parking tickets, dealing with it in July? Well, <laughs> directly because of time, you know, no one, the judges never say I'm throwing this case out because it's so old. Um, however, it's a whole lot easier um, to dismiss a case when, it, when, for whatever reason, it might be a close call when you're hearing it eight or nine months later because it just doesn't seem to be um, as important anymore. Um, I don't think you can put a number on that. Um, you know, delay does sometimes cause problems. I would say less so in judges just saying, this is such an old case, I'm gonna get rid of it. And more so with things like, where are the witnesses now a year down the line? Are we gonna be able to get them into court? Um, are they gonna be as you know, excited about maybe having to take a day off of work or you know, a couple hours off, out of work to be able to come in you know, to testify in a case that's a year old rather than one that might be only several weeks old? Thank you, Attorney Adams. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. Alderman, the um, report is September 2004. Yes, Alderman Groff. I have a question for you. Um, as it is right now, with you going to um, the courts uh, in the, at the courthouse, um, do you have a certain per percentage of your, your position description that you're supposed to be working on those cases? 
it's not in my job description. I'd estimate that I probably spend, it's, it's going down. Um, I would probably say I spend around three-fourths of my time on prosecution. I would, five, six years ago, I would have said 90 to 95%. It's not because it's getting to be less. It's just because it's becoming more routine, and it's some things you can just do in less time. And now with a municipal court, what would you estimate? My, I don't think my time in particular would be changed significantly. It, m it might be a little bit um, just simply because you might not have to deal with the case as often. There might not be as many points of contact because the case might get hurt a little more quickly. Um, but you know, I don't see necessarily spending less time in court. I think people will probably still contest tickets. I'll still have pre-trials, you know, two to three times a week. I'll probably still have, you know, court trials on a, on a regular basis. Um, so I don't necessarily see my time going down significantly, other than maybe the, you know, getting rid of some of the scheduling conferences. Okay. Is that something that's assigned to the assistant city attorney, or does the city attorney also handle those cases? Or in, in, it's, one. It, it's in my job description. Um, okay. Most of the time I do it, um, you know, in, in circuit court system, there are times when there have been scheduling issues where, um, you know, I've had to be in more than one court at once and I've had to ask Steve to cover for me. Um, we, tried, we try to avoid that and generally the judges are pretty good about realizing that, you know, he's got a full-time job too, uh, full of plenty, plenty of things to do. So they, they're pretty good about it, but it does happen on occasion. And have you ever, um approach the, um, the courts requesting additional time. Um, I know in my position at, uh, as, as child support director, um, we have often had to request additional time from the courts and normally they are um, very acceptable to that. So I was just wondering if, if we as a city had ever went there and said, well, could you sch schedule, uh, like for instance, I schedule um, uh, block time in each of the courts so that we know when our, when our cases will be heard. Do you do anything like that or is there a possibility of you doing something I've like talked that? to judges about that, not so much about requesting more time because that's not the, not so much the issue. It's, you know, we'd like to get, I, I would like to have some certainty. I know that I'm in court on certain days. It's easier for me to schedule. Um, the courts have, the general said, no, we don't want to do it that way um, because your cases are the lower priority. We'd like to fit them in where we can fit them in. Um, generally, where the contact comes is, you know, two, three, four times a week, I'm sending letters to the court saying, there's a conflict, I have to be in this branch at, at this time, and also at, on, in this branch at this time, can you move it? And, you know, most of the time, they're willing to do that. But of course, the problem is when you move it, you're also, I'll give as an example, um, uh, not the exact situation, but I was in court on Friday. Um, a young man had an operating while intoxicated ticket, um, and uh, he did not have an attorney. Uh, and I had I felt strongly he needed to talk to an attorney before he went to trial. Um, and he came to court without having talked to an attorney, <laughs> unfortunately, even though I told him to go do it. Um, and and he asked the judge, "Well, can I just have a different trial date?" Well, that's really what was necessary in this case. So I wasn't going to oppose an adjournment. Um, but now this case ended up getting moved three months uh, because of that. Uh, whereas, you know, you, you would like to maybe see that he could go talk to an attorney, come back in two or three weeks. Thank you, Attorney Adams, for your information. Yes, Alderman Eldenburg. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, another general question uh, for Attorney Adams. Uh, when you have a trial to the court, uh, the frequency with which you would have a city employee, either a sworn officer, building inspector, that would be subpoenaed to uh, provide testimony. Uh, every, every single case. Well, 99.99% of the cases. Okay. And uh, it may be perhaps a question for Deputy Chief Weiss. I, I trust that we pay call-in time uh, for, uh, for that. Uh, yes, that, that would be the case if the officer wasn't working and if he's on a different shift you'd be paying time and a half for that scheduled appearance. I think the benefit uh, in, the, in the municipal court would lie in the control over that scheduling. But yes, this would be time and a half. Thank you. 
If they, when, uh, is it time and a half for actual time, or is it like a two-hour call in if time? If the officer's working, he's, he's already working. So you're not paying anything additional. Right. But if he's not working, he has to be called in. Well, a minimum call in would be three hours pay. Okay. That was my question. <coughs> Thank you. Alderman Groff. Deputy Chief Weiss, um, one further question. Do you have a, um, an amount? I know finance has always asked for um, what amount of overtime is, is contributed to um, the cost of, of court work. No, I heard several it's, very, it's very hard to isolate that figure. When you control the scheduling process, you have the luxury of, of moving it around. We're never going to schedule a court for midnight. So the midnight shift officers are always going to be coming in if you, even if you control the scheduling. But if you have some flexibility to have, say, an evening court, there could very well be some savings on afternoon shift officers. Now, of course, if you've got day shift officers coming in for an evening court, you'd have to pay them time and a half. So the, the, the savings, if any, lies in the control over the scheduling. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is for Attorney Adams. Um, could you tell me what percentage of cases actually end up in circuit court? What percentage of, well, they, right now, 100% of The tickets of it. that are handed out, what percent of the tickets that are handed out actually go to municipal court? How many are settled out before they even get to court? Well, they all I go mean, to uh, circuit court. Yeah, well, they all go to circuit court, um, so the circuit court costs get added on right away. If the question is how many of them actually go to trial or how yes. many of them get pre-tried, I would say about, um, you know, I haven't looked at it recently. Um, it's as far as how many go to pretrial, that's certainly going up. I would say a third or more um, get contested, maybe even a half, get contested where they actually come into the pretrial conference. Out of those, I would say maybe a third or a little less of those um, actually go to trial. So I would estimate that of the, the ones that go to trial make up about 15 percent, I would guess. Uh, I think somebody had said there were I think I had heard somewhere in the report that, that, that you know we were estimating around 7,200 cases in a year. It's more than that, um, and that you know between 1,000 and 1,500 go go to uh, court. That 1,000 to 1,500 might be a little high, but that's that's pretty close. And is it true that we right now receive about $400,000 from the circuit court? Right. We we receive um, from the circuit court. Um, uh, on each case, the actual fine amount, um, uh, less $5 per case that they charge us, uh, plus then we receive um, the uh, officer's witness fees that are um, imposed on, on a defendant if, if they lose the case, which we would receive in municipal court as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Meyer. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The approximate cost for officers overtime for 2004 for the city of Sheboygan cases was $14,600. Thank you. And Alderman with information on hand. Thank you, Alderman Radke. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Um, actually, I just wanted to get some clarification from Alderperson Graf, being that he's the, the Chairman of Finance. Um, you had given the numbers earlier that were in the report in regards to the first year the court would run at a $3,600 loss, and then the following two years, you know, a $15,000 and $8,200 profit. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Whereas right now we are currently getting roughly four to $500,000 a year under the current system. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So to me, there's a huge financial disparity here. I mean, perhaps it's just because of the first three years, and I'm sure you're going to correct me yes, as to I'm why well. there's such a huge disparity. Because um, the, the court would make a, a contribution to the general fund in the tune of, in the second year, approximately $483,000, and in the uh, third year, approximately $476,000 would be their contribution, or what we could, the municipal court would collect for the fines and forfeitures that, that were assigned to us. Like right now, we get this $40,000, um, or $400,000, um, no, $40,000 a month. Isn't oh, yes, it? a month, yes. Yeah, approximately from um, the circuit courts. This would be the equivalent of that. So but that really, would go into the general fund, I believe. And Steve might have. 
a better answer or? Um, two things. Number one, I've made some more copies of that study report if mm -hmm. anybody would like them. Thank you. Uh, I didn't make the version that has all the exhibits, but uh, this has all the text and it also has the budget. Uh, I didn't make, well, there should be one for everybody, I, I believe. Well, at, least for, at least for the aldermen who don't have it, because mo um, at least half of us do have that. Then, then as far as the finances, it needs to be clarified that, uh, and I think it's in the report. Uh, well, actually, yeah, it's in the, uh, the bigger version. I think it's one of the exhibits that has the pro forma budget. It's exhibit six if you've got the bigger version and it's not, I'm sorry, it's not in that smaller packet, but the, uh, for instance, the uh, estimate in year one um, estimated $461,500 in forfeitures. Uh, basically, that would be uh, whether or not you're in circuit court or municipal court. In other words, we currently net about $400,000 from circuit court. What we're talking about is not netting $8,000. We're talking about netting $408,000. You know, it's that much and more. Uh, after, the issue is uh, you get more revenue in because uh, there's less court costs that are going to the state. That's the primary difference. Uh, but then you've got city operating costs to offset that increased revenue that you're generating. And the balance is, are you generating enough additional revenue to cover the new additional expenses that you've got? And the, the report had, I think, a slight deficit in the first year. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, slight uh, uh, surpluses in years two and three. Now, uh, one thing that that didn't take into consideration, uh, and uh, you know, I was on the committee, the, uh, it didn't factor in the capital costs of a uh, municipal court in, say, the new police station. It was the recommendation of the committee was that on a temporary interim basis that the court be held in the council chambers, but uh, the committee did not feel that that was a good long-term solution, and uh, and frankly, the problem is now you don't have a uh, a court facility to move to, so this would become uh, longer than just a temporary quick fix. It it would probably be several years the way things are going. Um, the the report made a recommendation that if and when a new police station was built, that consideration be given to incorporating facilities for a municipal courtroom in the police station. Uh, so that that would have to be you know, part of the police station budget. Um, if it's not in there, then the issue is where do you hold the court? Um, and do you continue to hold it in the council chambers, which like I say, is not an optimum facility for a courtroom. Uh, so that's all I've got there. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Alderman, as I said again, they said before, the information, well, I think um, Attorney McLean just provided it to you. That's right, so you don't have to call Sue Richards to get a copy because now you have it. Except for all the exhibits. Except for all the exhibits. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Alderman Graff. Thank you so much. Let's move on to agenda item number I, four. Is that over? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I thought there's... Nobody else? Correct. Okay. Nobody else from the committee. Okay. Right. Agenda item number four, um, submitting a communication from Dimple Adams speaking up about the building and site selection of the new police station. I would move to file. Second. Um, and I, I just wanted to say um, we've read um, communications from Dimple Adams. We've listened to Dimple Adams. And Dimple, I bet we know how you feel about the police station sites. And I thank you for all for sending us these letters and for keeping in touch with us. Is there any further discussion on this second. particular 
letter Who from the Jim second? Adams. Who is the second? I second. Alderman Sigali. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you not going to let uh, Dimple Adams um, discuss her letters um, here at the committee? Did you want to open the floor to Dimple Adams? Yes, I make that motion, please. Okay. We have a motion and a second to open the floor to Dimple Adams to speak about her letter. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. I think you have it, Dimple. And we do have your letters, and we have re read your letter. One more. Hello. Do I need to give you my address or anything? Yes, please do that. Okay, my address is 1424 Virginia Avenue, Sheboygan. And um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And um, it's good to know that you've read my letter and that you're going to give it uh, some consideration. <laughs> of course, you know where I stand on where I want the police station built. Um, it's not because I live a half a block from Sheridan Park and because I got irritated that Sheridan Park uh, was rescinded as the site. However, I do think it's important without being repetitive tonight to say that this council did make a decision on May 9th that changed everything. And you made a decision to say, we're not going to build a police station that the previous council voted on five times, had at least 80 meetings on, and 49 site studies. You know, you would have thought with the way that uh, the arguments were coming across there, that they just put up a dartboard with the names of the different sites and threw the darts and that Sheridan Park won. That's not how it happened. They chose Sheridan Park for basically three reasons. One was centrally located. Two was acquisition cost was zero. And three, the police department of all the sites that were studied preferred that site. And I'm sure there were other things too, but they felt like the cost would be the best and that it would just be the best fit for the whole thing. Okay, so now we're down to five sites. And I just want to point out that, you know, as I came on the, on the 20th, I believe it was, that Wednesday night, um, that we had the community input session. And we all got up here and we talked. And we, you know, said that I, I did choose Vandervart. I choose Vandervart now because that's the police preferred site. And they're not just saying that that's the preferred site because they threw a dart again. It really is the most centrally located. It is on a big northwest, north-south you know, street and also uh, has easy access to all parts of the city in a timely manner. And I think that's extremely important. And I think if you don't think that that's extremely important, then maybe you need to go on a ride along or something like that to, to, um, to uh, get better acquainted with why central location is so important with our police department. And that, that's basically it. One other thing though, last week I saw this council get all excited about the spaceport, right? Where is it going to be? It's going to be right down here on Pan and Fourth, right? Well, that parking lot that we might have to give up if we go to um, 23rd Street, it's on the corner of, is it 7th and Penn or 6th and Penn? Pardon? 7th. So we're talking three blocks away that we're thinking about giving up a very valuable parking lot that will even become more valuable if the spaceport goes in, and we really do have 
a lot more tourism in our area, downtown. Thank you. You're welcome, Dimple. Just as a bit of clarification, um, the voting about Sheridan Park was the first vote to say yes to Sheridan Park. The second one was a vote not to rescind. The next vote was no referendum for the citizens. And then the next one was no to the new council. Right, right. When I say that there were four votes about Sheridan Park, they were all to say that we stand by our initial vote on August 2nd. Would I be right with that, Madam yes, Chairman? Yes, you would be right with that. Yes, That's the way I meant for that to right. be. And I think, as I stated it in the letters, I did put that one was a referendum vote and one was, you know, I mean, I didn't, you know, I think I put what the votes were for. And um, also, I would like to congratulate you that you did not allow another referendum to delay this. I'd like to see this police station start construction within the next few months. Thank you. Thank you, Dimple. Um, Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I was not here when the, when the architect was picked for the police department uh, station. Who actually picked that? Was that the police department? The council approved that? Is that how that worked? Uh huh. Who and knows? I guess Who my remembers? next question is this. Okay, <clears throat> at one time Sheridan Park was the number one site. Today, Vanderbart's the number five site, according to that draft report we read. So how can we went from wanting the best site to the worst site here? I, I don't understand what's going on here. I mean, they wanted the best site, we're looking for it, now they're looking at the worst site, and this is their architect. Thank you, Alderman Radke. We won't debate with the, with, with the citizens. Thank you. Um, I have a motion and a second to file Dimple's communication. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Aye. Agenda item number five, letter from Gina Steinhardt and Jeffrey Allen Bubb regarding their analysis of the architectural firm of Zimmerman's report. And again, uh, Gina I would, Stein. I would move to file. Second? Second. Second. Any further discussion? Alderman Serda. I move to open the floor to Gina Steinhardt or Jeffrey Allen Bubb. There's a motion to open the floor and a second to open the floor to Gina Steinhardt and Jeffrey Allen Bubb. Any, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Gina Steinhardt and Jeffrey Allen Bubb, go ahead. And we have your letter and we've your communication and we've read it. Thank you. Okay. Um, you said you needed addresses. I'm at 1311 Maryland Avenue. Thank you. And uh, and I live at uh, 2906A South 10th Street. Thank you, Mr. Bob. And I guess, you know, what Mr. Radke said before, I'd like to address that if he read this report, as you said, very thoroughly and, right, and saw that there are some very glaring discrepancies here that put Vandervaart last when they really shouldn't be. It should be second, maybe even first, even just cost-wise, not to do with emotions, not to do with preferences or anything. This is just cost. There is a lot of things that are missing and that aren't put in there equally across the board, and it shows some specific ones that I just picked out that were more obvious than the others. And, you know, you can see where they don't have anything available or they have zeros down, and these things are going to need to be dealt with. You can't put zero down for demolition on City Hall or on North 23rd Street. We know that there's going to be buildings taken down. We know there's going to be land acquisition costs and those too. Zero for City Hall. Where are we going to put the parking structure? We don't even know. We don't even have a cost for that. So you can't put zero down. That puts City Hall way at the top of the list in a completely unfair and, and misleading manner because the cost for Vandervaart were put way too high. They only want um, 15, 1.5 million, so this is way off already. Plus, if we sold 10 acres, as he said, said at the meeting, then we'd make about a million dollars back. So it would only cost 0. 0.5 million for acquisition. So this whole, thing, this whole cost comparison is so far off that if you guys use this straight the way it is without considering all of these problems, such as cable being so far screwed up or, or um, the radio tower being completely different costs, you know, that they're a $225,000 difference depending on the cost. 
I mean, these are huge discrepancies. They're not small, and they, they're obviously <laughs> set up in a way that makes Vandervaart look bad and City Hall and North 23rd Street look good, even though the costs aren't completely current. So as you can see on the second page, the parking lot wasn't put in, the parking garage wasn't put in. That shoots North 23rd Street and City Hall way up over 19 million, and nobody wants to spend that. And if you guys really look at this, I'm not making up these numbers. They're all from that Zimmerman report. They're all from the report that you guys looked at. These aren't correct. There is problems with this report. And, and the problem, of course, is, is, is public perception. I mean, you know, you, you give this report out and you go, here, see, all these numbers state or give a strong indication that one, two, three, four, and five fall into this order. The press gets a hold of it, releases it to the public, and suddenly you got the entire city believing the exact same thing. When in fact, the numbers really haven't been crunched properly for the bottom line for the public. And I think it's a really big responsibility to make sure that the public understands what the final costs are going to be in the end of the project. I mean, this, this report might just be considering the fact that these are only going to be the costs of building, the, the building or constructing the police station per se. But we all know there's so much more involved in that that you know, initially ends up with your final dollar figure. And I think that's what the public really wants to know. And if you just release this report as is, I think it misleads the public. I, not purposely, but it just doesn't give them the proper perspective on what is really the best site cost-wise of the five sites available. Alderman Racky, you know, he, he admitted that he thought the Vandervaart site was the fifth spot on the list. And I think the general public, the general public has that same perception only simply because of what the information is being released from this council and Sheboygan Press. So I think these numbers really need to be looked at a lot better. And I think, uh, I think after reanalyzing the final cost of what it's going to take the taxpayer to build this new police station, then you tell the public what you think is the number one, two, and three, four, five spots. Otherwise, you're really making this decision based on politics and emotions, like everybody said you're not supposed to be making these decisions on. It's supposed to be on a very objective viewpoint. It's supposed to be made solely on cost. This report isn't coming across totally clearly apples to apples type of thing. It's way off. There are big mistakes. Maybe not mistakes, okay, omissions, whatever. I'm not saying that anybody did this on purpose, but it's, it's really obvious to just us two. I'm sure if any of you look at these same figures, you can see having one site $2 million more than the other site, just based on only these particular items that we picked out, then there's a problem. And we didn't, I didn't, and these final figures on the second page, we didn't change any of those first figures. We only added the parking lot issue, the sale of the land issue, and the parking garage issue. And just by adding those three items in that were omitted, that makes drop-off site come up number one, Vandervaart is number two, um, Penn Avenue is number three, City Hall is next, and North 23rd Street is the most expensive, and also the worst site according to the police station, the neighbors, the public, and everybody else. So if you guys pick that site, you're going against what everybody's asking you to do. Thank you, Ms. Steinart. Thank you, Mr. Bob. I have a difficulty casting aspersions on the firm of Zimmerman and Savanat, but I thank you for no, your I information. Don't mean I mean, you. it's just there's some omissions. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this question could apply here after that statement. Um, can we invite Zimmerman back to address some of these questions? Do I need a separate motion for that, or can I just make that request? I'm, I will be um, making a motion when we get done filing these to, to do that very thing. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Serda. We have a motion and a second to file the communication from Gina Steinhardt and Jeffrey Allen Bubb. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Agenda item number six, a communication from Jerry Hemsing offering several suggestions for the city to review regarding the location of the new police station. Recommends that the report of officer be accepted and placed on file. Alderman Vanderweel thanked Mr. Hemsing for his ideas and informed him that his document will be referred to the Committee of the Whole, which it was. We have it, we've read it. I'll entertain a motion to file. So moved. 
We have a motion and a second to file. Is there any discussion? Alderman Van Der Weyl. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is Jerry Hemsing here tonight? No. And so I, I did talk with him personally and invited him. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Van Der Weyl. We have a motion and a second to file the communication from Mr. Hemsing. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion is filed. Alderman Graf. Thank you, Your Honor. The next item is, is a possible action on selecting two sites for the new police station. Uh, the mayor informed me before the meeting that he has received the final Zimmerman report, and um, they're in the process of um, making copies for all of us. So I don't think we should do number seven until we get that final report and then also invite uh, Zimmerman uh, back in here to answer the questions that, as proposed at a new, newly scheduled uh, committee of the whole meeting, um, which would be um, raised, I don't know when the next one would be, but um, if we continue the practice of um, uh, every other Tuesday, it would be... Um, Monday. Uh, Monday, excuse me. Uh, it would be um, the, I can't 12. read that, 12th of uh, September. Alderman, you have, if, if we're getting another report, I think we have our work cut out for us, more reading to do. I, I don't know if the mayor wants to add anything to that, but. Well, Mayor, would you be willing to let Alderman Dan Berg say a word? Please. Well, I was gonna, if this came up tonight, I was gonna show you 168 signatures from all the people that live around the 23rd Street site that are 110% against the police department being built on the 23rd Street site, but uh, I gave this to the clerk, so most of you should uh, have a copy of these. More information for us to peruse. Thank you, Alderman Dan Burke. Please, Mr. Mayor, Your Honor. Thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, Alderman Groff said earlier, uh, I received the final draft of the Zimmerman report, and I communicated the, the receipt of that report to the president of the council. It is in final draft form, and what that means is that <coughs> tweaking a little bit of the report but the findings are not going to change. And I asked uh, Mr. Zimmer, uh, John Sabin, asked Mr. Sabin asked if I could share at least the site evaluations with the council, and he said, feel free to do so. I'd, it, I'd like to point out that in the, every report obviously has a, uh, an executive summary. The executive summary is not a very lengthy one. It's half a page, but it does point out that the two superior sites are 23rd Street location and the City Hall location. And if we go a little further, and this report will be finalized sometime this week, so I'll be able to copy the final report. But as I said, he indicated to me that I could share with you that the site evaluations will not change. If you look at the site evaluations, the final count would put 23rd Street as number one, City Hall as number two, drop-off site in Pennsylvania Avenue, a close tie, 91 points apiece, and the Vandervaard being last. This is a report that was done by Zimmerman. Now, it's interesting to note that when the independent report that was sponsored by Mr. Mike Muth and other individuals in the community who were concerned about Sheridan Park and the location of the police station and shared services, when that report came out, there appeared to be a clash between the Zimmerman findings and the independent report. At that time, the integrity of Mr. Sabinash was never questioned. Now that the report is not saying what some people would hope it says, his integrity is being questioned. And quite frankly, I don't support that. I don't think that we're in a position to question the integrity of the findings of an individual who has worked pretty hard amongst a lot of dispute, a lot of debate, to, to make these findings in the best way that he can. He's used an incredible amount of, of uh, experience building police stations uh, himself and his staff. So we have a report, hopefully, that will finalize the findings that were, that were asked by this council of Mr. Zim, of Mr. Sabinash to go out, evaluate five, six sites. One was knocked off, 
five remaining. He's done his job. We paid him close to $30,000 for doing it. These are the findings. I think uh, that when, uh, you sh when you read this findings, it'll be very interesting reading, very compelling reading. And I will share these as soon as Mr. Sabinash, before the end of the week, sends the final report. Thank you, Your Honor. How many pages do we need to read now? I believe somebody, I didn't count them, but I think Mary Rager did say close to 75. Okay. Get your spectacles out. Thank you, Your Honor. Alderman Sigali. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Could, we, could I please ask Deputy Chief Weiss if he has already seen this report and if you know what the findings were? And were you, um, were you asked concerning the final findings, please? Uh, no, I haven't seen that report. I don't, I'm not sure if, if this has been delivered to the chief's office. I, I haven't seen a report. And uh, what was your second question? Were we part of it? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, Deputy Chief Weiss, no one has seen this report except me and the finance director. I haven't even shared it with the council. So if, before I even okay. share it to staff, I will share it with the council first. And I'm not prepared to do that until we get the final version. As I said, staff should not be reading final reports until the council does. Thank you, Your Honor. Alderman Serda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Interesting enough that, um, that questions are perceived as criticism, and yet at one time one individual was criticizing Zimmerman to it, but now things are, I guess, going that way, so now we shouldn't ask questions. But getting to what I was going to talk about here, um, I'm going to make a plea to the public for accountability and for the media as well because some of you may be under the impression with Vandervaart and the information that they had presented here weeks ago that the city was following up on that. Well, I'm here to tell you that nothing was done. I contacted Vandervaart to see if the city had contacted them on behalf of the information and the willingness to do a land swap. Nothing. I was told that the ball is in Vandervaart's court. Now, interesting how this site can, can quote that City Hall and 23rd Street site is some of the, the best two sites. And still, you had Vandervaart come here and present that they were willing to do a land swap. That's not even factor it, factored in. Something's wrong. I stopped by Vandervaart today, reiterating once again, they want to pursue possible land swap. Now I'm asking you, as chairwoman, do you need a motion for our city employee, Paulette Enders, including Tom Holton, and the, forgive me, because they didn't know I was asking this, to, do, to speak on behalf of the city, to formulate numbers, to talk to Vandervaart and find out what, what they exactly want, put that in terms on paper so we as a council can vote. The public has the perception that Vandervaart is being spoken to, that this land swap is being considered. I do not want to just have them talking and nothing done. So I need to know, do you need a motion to have our employees do this? Do you feel that, that the information that, that Mr. Teetink gave to us regarding the numbers, it would be different than if we spoke to him privately? How many of us in this room understand and, and can equate what actual site they want, how that equates in terms of reducing the cost at Vandervaart? How many in here can say they know that right now? They want 14 acres. They want us to, to buy 14 acres. Do you remember what they said here last, the last time they're here? It wasn't just the industrial parts. Do you remember what else they were talking about? Ah, the Heisen. Exactly. Where is that today? Thank you, Alderman Serda. Uh, I've heard another. I'll still need an answer if you need a motion. Yes. I think Tom Holton. Well, no, that's not you. You're an engineer. Alderman Graf. I think you can bring that motion in, but you can't bring it in tonight because it's not on the agenda. But I think you can, can develop a... a um, a resolution or something asking for that, and that's maybe what's needed um, for the council to look at. Right now, I think we've been looking at what Paulette and Tom had put together, as well as what Zimmerman had put together, so that we can uh, narrow it down to two or three or whatever we need, and then uh, then go out after that more information. I'm I'm just. Vanderbart kind of is on the table, and it all the information should be considered at the same time. Right, but um. We've, we're supposed to narrow it down at some point, or right. do you want to do a five, five people? How does that relate, though, to having the accurate information so we can well, narrow it down? Well, it, we would be at a disadvantage if we tried to narrow it down without all of the information. Correct. I agree. You're going to bring in a resolution that somebody talked to Vandervaart about the Heisen property. Yeah. 
Thank you. And I think we also need to owe Vandervart an apology that we haven't followed up with, uh, with them on this. Thank you, Alderman Serda. Alderman Danberg. No, I don't see why we couldn't bring in, why she couldn't make a motion tonight. It's, we're talking police station. We're talking about police station sites. Yeah, they're, they're, we're taking possible action to, to select two sites, and that isn't the, the well, action. I think, I think Alderman Serda would be very happy to bring the resolution in. I don't think she would mind bringing that in at all. This body is a, if I may, um, this body is a, the, the deliberatory body of the council. I know. Okay. I know. Thank you, Alderman Barrett. Alderman Radke. Thank you, Madam Chairman. As I recall back to the Heisen property that we were talking about, um, Paul had Ender said at the time that Heisen property is not contiguous to the city, so it's not going to help our tax base anyway. So why would we want to go that route? It's not going to help the city. We want to keep them in the city. We don't want to send them out of the city. Well, that may be so, but I think Alderman Serda would like all that information to be presented to, um, to Vandervar. Thank you, Alderman Radke. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Attorney Steve McLean, what's your opinion about how uh, Alderman Serta should handle this? Well, I, I think you've got to get direction to staff. Uh, number one, um, you know, this is just, this is committee of the whole. It's a committee meeting. It's not a council meeting as far as negotiating with somebody um, that really ought to be coming through the council. Uh, if that's what you're talking about, Alderman Serta. Uh, so I don't disagree that should be perhaps council action to, to talk further with Vandevoort. Uh, although, if it's just preliminary information, you know, staff can do that probably without uh, any formal action by the council. Uh, but I'm not sure that, you know, any staff members were aware that the council was interested in getting that information in making their decision, so uh, I think it's a matter of communication to the to the staff. If you want them to uh, uh, try to generate some information that's preliminary for discussion purposes, uh, I don't know that that would have to go to council. But as far as uh, council authorizing some negotiations for possible purchase or land swap, I think that that should go through council. Thank you, Attorney McLean. I have a question. Alderman Serda. Um, Mr. McLean, I have a question for you. The reason why I ask it this way is because I was told at one time by a department staff that if I was requesting certain information that I need to ask in front of the council to do so and that's why I proceeded this way. I guess as an older person I need to know then what's my rights as far as gaining some information from the department staff. Do I have to go through the direction of the council all the time? I guess I was perceiving that they would follow up on that and... Well I, th I think Alderman sort of... Uh, Departmental staff, the department heads, and things need to get some sense from the council as to what you want them to do. And I, I do think it's unfair if an individual alderman says, you know, could you go over here and you know do this all all this information, uh, just unilaterally without some sense that that's what the council as a whole is interested in, uh, because then department heads kind of get fragmented in a lot of different ways. You've got different aldermen saying, I'd like you to do this, I'd like you to do that, and uh, you know, they're not gonna accomplish anything. Uh, they really need to get some sense <coughs> from the group as to what you'd like them to do, uh, as opposed to, I think, uh, doing work for individual aldermen, you know, uh, gaining uh, a lot of detailed information that's gonna take a fair amount of time to get. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney McLean. And Alderman Serta, you're gonna take care of that piece of paper. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you at the council meeting. I know I'm right, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> you were wrong that time, buddy. <laughs> we'll get Mr. Bladorn over here. We'll do an interview with the referees. Hartman got a hand on the ball. <laughs>